This is the lecture for Friday. Yes, Friday. <laughs> Friday, the 9th of, June, of April 2021. We had talked about the Byzantines. Uh, we had talked about uh, their empire, their rise up to the time of the Battle of Mansikert and the call westward for help against the uh, the Turks. Now we're going back in time. I talked about the Byzantines because they were the first light of civilization that shined light at least somewhere near our Dark Age in Western Europe. There's a second light of civilization, and it's the only one that comes from within our Western civilization, and that is the Christian Church. When Rome falls, the Western Christian Church, the Latin Church, otherwise known as the Catholic Church, survives. By this point, every Roman government bureaucratic level that has been had been built by the old dominate was reflected in the church. The word diocese, which refers to a bishop's realm, in not only the Roman Catholic Church, but many others. The word diocese was originally used by the Roman government for a region like a county that uh, needed to be ruled. So the church remains. Why? Were the barbarians superstitious? Well, some of them, yeah. Attila the Hun particularly was superstitious. Aside from my wife, my best friend on earth is a Presbyterian minister. And he and I were buddies in college, and we still are today. And one of the things that he has to do from time to time as a minister is go into some pretty nasty, scary, crime-ridden neighborhoods. And when he does that, he always wears his collar. Now, a Presbyterian minister isn't like many kinds of Catholic priests. Most of the time, priests, at least traditionally, dress like priests. Ministers can dress like whatever. But he wore his collar for a particular reason whenever he went into these dangerous areas. Can any of you guess why? Why would somebody... Yeah. Is there a certain amount of like respect for people like that? Yeah. Look... View it magically and selfishly rather than in a Christian fashion. I mean, many of the tough guys in bad neighborhoods actually have moms who are religious, so there's some of that that passes through. But let's assume that they're not personally religious in any significant way. A priest is a holy man. A minister is a holy man, like a shaman, like a witch doctor. <clears throat> that means they have a secret knowledge. That means some power is looking over their shoulder. Just like you think it's bad luck, maybe, to break a mirror or to cross the path of a black cat or to walk under a ladder or any number of things that people think are bad luck. Harming a holy man, harming a shaman or a witch doctor, is just stupid. Because what you're doing is you're inviting bad luck. So people who would rough up any stranger, especially a white stranger in some of these neighborhoods, they usually don't even mess with, they don't even challenge or verbally challenge a person in a collar. Now, the person in the collar can't act, act obnoxiously e either. If they push it, there's going to be a conflict. And maybe sometimes there needs to be. But in general terms, my friend was able to get into apartment buildings that were run by gangs, and he didn't have any trouble because that collar was a sign that he was working not for the police, but for a higher power. And even if they didn't personally believe in that higher power, they were superstitious enough not to, not to mess with it. So one of the reasons why the church survives through the Dark Ages, or in the early phase of the folks wandering when the Germanic peoples are coming in, is that for the most part, with the exception of the Lombards, who attacked Italy after the Byzantine period. With the exception of them, for the most part, churches and priests and nuns and monks and other holy-type peoples were off-limits. 
And often, one of the places you could run for safety from the barbarians was to your local church, because not all barbarian chieftains were willing to burn down a church full of people. They'd burn down a house full of people. They'd certainly burn down a fortress full of people. But a group of people in a church might be safe because of that superstition. Second reason why it survives. With the exception of the Lombards and the Huns, and those are two big exceptions, Everyone else, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals had all been converted to Christianity about a hundred years before they conquered Rome. What that means is that the Volkswanderings, for the most part, were by Christian barbarians over Christian Romans. Now, this Christianity of the barbarians doesn't stop them from being violent, tough guys. Oh, gosh, they're violent. Oh, gosh, they're tough guys. This is absolutely true. But the fact that they're both Christian does moderate the degree of violence. Now, they are warrior Christians, and there is a long history in Christianity of being a fighting Christian, believe it or not. So the barbarians see themselves as fighting Christians, as being fighting Christians. And when they conquer the Romans, well, they're just another kind of Christian. The Romans had better stop messing with them and do what they're told. But if the Romans hide behind the skirts of priests, well, that's an indication of surrender now, isn't it? They're surrendering to the will of God. And the will of God may be that you all gather so I can burn you alive in your church, the barbarian chieftain says to himself. Or the will of God may be that I walk in there and say, if any of you are going to have any problems with me being the boss of you now, speak now or forever hold your peace. However, even though these barbarians with the exception of the Huns and of the Lombards, were Christians. That only goes so far. Here's why. The Roman Christians who were conquered are Catholic Christians. Now, the word Catholic means universal. By the strict definition of the term Catholic, Every Christian, whether they're Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Protestant or Baptist, Anabaptist, Quaker, Shaker, Reformed Christian, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, doesn't matter. We're all part of the universal Christian church, that is the Catholic ch Christian church. That's why in the Nicene Creed, which we did when we did Christianity, uh, the third paragraph includes, and I believe in one holy and apostolic Catholic church. It's not so much that every Christian says we respect Rome's church, the Pope's church, not the Roman Catholic church, but the universal. Catholic means universal. So if I were to, if you were to ask me, what are my tastes in music? I would say they're a bit Catholic. And while I do like Gregorian chants from the Middle Ages sung by monks, that doesn't mean that my taste in music is, is all religious. I like all kinds of music, almost all kinds. Most country and rap lose me. But with those two exceptions, there are a few country and rap songs I even kind of like. But in general terms, I, 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 if I'm in the right mood for it, I can, I can find something to like about most every kind of music. I have Catholic tastes. That means I have universal tastes. If you like, um, you know, what kind of movies do you like? What kind of uh, video games do you like? Well, if you like a wide variety, you may have Catholic tastes. The Romans were Catholic Christians. They were Latin Christians. They were Latin-speaking Christians. And they were part of the church set up in imitation of the Roman government. But as I've said before, this is a reminder. A heretic left Roman lands about 100 years before the, Rome, the conquest. His name was Arius. And Arius had beliefs about the humanity of Christ that went too far towards emphasizing humanity over spirit for the Roman church. So the Roman church was going to punish him to, as, a, as a heretic, as a false teacher, as a teacher of falsehoods. But Arius goes to the Germans beyond the power of the Roman Catholic Church 
and uh, preaches and converts them. So the German barbarians are converted to Christianity, but it's a different denomination at a time when that matters. So, for example, even though the Vandals are Christians and the Romans are Christians, when the Vandals sack Rome in the 450s, they're really nasty. And they will burn churches and kill priests and rape nuns and kill them. How can they justify that? Well, Aryan Christianity among the Vandals is rather puritanical. Roman Catholic Christianity at that point doesn't allow for open homosexuality, but it doesn't punish it either. And the Vandals see this as a sign that the Christians of Rome have fallen into decadent ways, evil ways. Because the Christians of Rome tolerate the intolerable, which the Vandals call homosexuality is intolerable, then the Christian church is complicit with evil. And therefore that the Christian church of Rome isn't really Christian anymore, and it needs to be shown it's the error of its ways. So the Vandals come in like the holy fury of God to punish the Roman Christians <clears throat> for being too tolerant of things that the Vandals are not tolerant about. But this difference between being an Aryan Christian and a Roman Christian takes on other, um, other things. Being an Aryan is a sign that you're part of the ruling class. Being an Aryan Christian means that you're among the people who conquered. You're not among the people who are conquered. You're among the people who do the conquering. So it's a status symbol. And this difference between Aryan Christianity and Roman Catholic Christianity is going to be a problem for a couple hundred years. So long as that provision holds. Now, it still means that the Christian church largely survives. Because the Goths and the Franks and the others, uh, maybe Roman Christianity, but it's still Christianity. So there's some degree of leeway given. There's some degree, uh, some degree of mercy shown to the religious people, and there's some degree of superstition with which religious people are viewed. Now, the old Western Roman Empire, I guess I'll use one of the pull-down maps. The old Western Roman Empire is Latin-speaking, largely. So, Italy, the Western Balkans, Iberia, Gaul, and Britannia, as well as North Africa to Carthage, and Libya, they speak Latin. They were conquered by Rome. And for the most part, they were barbarians when Rome conquered them. So, Latin speakers, and these are the people that give allegiance to the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope. But in the East, most of the people are Greek speakers. And Rome had conquered the East at a time when the East was civilized. Greece, very civilized. Chironatia, Egypt, Judea, Syria, Asia Minor, or Anatolia, all very civilized. So when the Romans come in, the Latin-speaking Romans form the upper class. But the most educated and sophisticated people spoke Greek. And soon, Roman aristocrats made sure that their children learned Greek as well as Latin. So they could read the Iliad and the Odyssey in the original Greek. It's a lot like today, where certain families want their kids to understand French as well as English, or Spanish as well as English. But no, Spanish doesn't have the same hoity-toity cachet that French does. Thus, I use the, notice I use the word cachet, because it's frog talk. It's French. Um, if you're in a family that wants to have the status of being cultured, of being seen to be cultured, learning French as a second language is a good way to do that. It's not the most functional language. Actually, it would be good for you to learn Spanish or Mandarin Chinese, uh, German, Russian. 
mean, this is from a person who speaks English and bad English, so I know a few phrases in other languages, but I am nothing like fluent in any of them, and I took two years of high school Spanish. And my father and grandfather, and on my father's side, uh, was all Spanish-speaking. But I don't speak Spanish, <clears throat> not as well as some of you already speak it. What that means is <clears throat> that the Greek world is Latinized a bit, but mostly it's the Romans ruling over Hellenized Eastern populations. And when the Western Empire falls, more and more people in the East just stop learning Latin. There's no need. Instead, let's use Greek, not only as the language of culture, but the language of government. This is why it was important that Justin only spoke Latin, but Justinian spoke Latin and Greek. The people here are Greek-speaking. So that's a fundamental difference. The people here have been civilized for a long time. That's a fundamental difference with the West, which is largely rural now. But that's not all. Because the Christian church in the East does not have a Roman Pope. <clears throat> the great cities of the early Christian church are Jerusalem, where Jesus died and was resurrected. Alexandria, which is the greatest city in Roman Egypt and in Byzantine Egypt, and all the way up through the Arab conquest. Alexandria is a huge city with a massive Greek population, a massive Jewish population, a massive population. It's, it's basically like New York City today, it, or London today. It's a city of people from all over the world. That's Alexandria. That's a great city. Antioch is a great center of Christianity. So we got Jerusalem, Alexandria, Antioch, St. Paul goes there. And we've got Constantinople, the new capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. All of these cities have a patriarch. There's a patriarch of Jerusalem, of Alexandria, of Antioch, and of Constantinople. In the West, the only patriarch-level priest is the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. So in the East, the Christian Church is much less Roman, much less Latin-speaking, much less Catholic. It's different. These church leaders have to agree with one another, and they also have to be in agreement with whoever the emperor of the Byzantines are. The Roman Pope doesn't have to worry about an emperor anymore. So the fact that the people are so different, the language is so different, and the church traditions are not one hierarchy coming from Rome, but there are four different cities with four different hierarchies that have to come cooperate with one another. All of this is going to mean that the Church of Christ in the East and the Church of Christ in the West are going to drift. Think of it this way. You all speak like people from America, from North Idaho in particular, but America. No doubt there are a few words that I say that sound weird to your ears, because I learned to speak English around New York City and in New England. And in New York City and New England, there are some distinct regional accents. See, I'm sitting here so I can actually see you. And you. Let's imagine, though, that you have a brother or a twin of some kind, twin brother, twin sister, or just somebody close to you in your family. And you've both grown up here. One of you moves to the deep south, to Alabama, where they have a really strong southern accent. The other one of you moves to Southern California, surfer culture California, deep California. And you're there from ages 14 to 24, 15 to 25. You're each in your own environments for 10 years. Now, at the point of separation, you and your sibling would speak the same dialect of English. But after 10 years immersed in the Deep South, y'all would have some differences with the dude from California. You see how that works? Just by being immersed in a different language group, you learn to speak a different variety of English. So when I moved to Korea, I was like probably four or five years old. My little brother was like two or three, I think. And so, like, he was, he, st he knew how to talk, of course, but, like, after spending, like, some years in Korea, like, he started to have trouble with, like, his L's and his R's, 
and he like couldn't pronounce them as well and it took like after we moved back it took him a while to like learn how to talk right because he talked like the korean speak english not like we speak english. i'll bet yeah that's 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 interesting I, i'll bet also he probably learned some korean words and phrases yeah but he forgot all of them by now <laughs> yeah because we adapt especially as a child ch you know children are sponges if i really cared about children uh about people learning many languages in the united states i would i would want them to teach not only english but at least one or two other languages in elementary school. If you could have foreign language teaching done at kindergarten level, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you would learn the language in a way that is so much more natural because your brain is still at a point where it's absorbing language. By the time you get to junior high school or high school, your brain has largely accepted its primary language and it's almost set in its ways. So to learn French or Spanish or German or Italian or Chinese is all about the mind. It's about learning vocabulary lists. It's a grind. It's studying. It's hard. If you had learned it younger as a kid, it would have been a lot easier because the human mind simply absorbs language better. Yes, all right. Uh, when my mom was growing up, she lived in, she lived in Thailand, and there, people speak uh, different right? Some people speak Cambodian and some people speak Thai. So if you live, if you live in um, where my mom lives, she spoke. Uh, she speaks Cambodian and Thai mm -hmm. because there's a lot of locals there from Cambodia. So that's so yeah. People speak from Cambodia too. Uh, so and that you know, makes total sense. Like, or, I don't know. Or, 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 can, and Cambodian and Thai are very different languages from each other, and they're very different languages from, from English. And frankly, the European languages that Cambodians would learn would be French, would have been traditionally French, not English, because Cambodia was a part of French Indochina up until about 1952. The reason, do you know why most Cam, so many Cambodians are inside Thailand? Uh, yeah. What happened was the communists at the end of our Vietnam War, the communists took over Cambodia. When they took over in 1975, it was a nation of about three, three and a half million people. In 1979, the Cambodian communists were overthrown by the Vietnamese communists. And there were about a million and a third people left. They kill between a third and half their population in four years. So huge numbers of people to get away from that crossed into Thailand, but it wasn't an easy experience. It's interesting that your mom learned both of that. How's her English? Is her English good? Uh, she has an accent. I can't tell she has an accent. Everyone... Well, of course, she's mom. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk to her about what she, what she remembers, because that's just fascinating to me. It's fascinating history. Um, and look, the fact that she, she can speak English. I, I'm amazed by people who are good with languages. I'm not. Uh, I, uh, my, my best friend, the minister's wife is Chinese. She came over here from China and she speaks, uh, perfect Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese Chinese, her local dialect from Suzhou, China, uh, as well as English, French, German. Uh, she's just incredible. She can speak, read and write all of those. <laughs> That's wow. And she knows a bit of Japanese too. Yeah. Um, so my great grandmother, she, um, she came here from Russia. So in the time that I, I knew her, I am, kind of remember, she still would occasionally use Russian words when I, I would sometimes come over with my family. And also, I remember she had a, she still had a bit of a Russian accent as well. Did she ever say, Boja moi? I, no, but whenever I came, came to her, she would always refer her to me in a Russian word saying, little Zoe. Oh, that's sweet. Is it Zoichka? Zoichka. Yeah, Zoichka. Zoichka. That's it. Um, yeah. Bojomoy is a typical Russian exclamation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's something actually that, that translated, that went into the Yiddish as well, because Eastern European Jews. Yeah, my grandma, my grandma's not like Russian, but she's, everyone in her family, when she was younger, they speak, they all speak Yiddish. Mm-hmm. So when my grandma talks to me, she calls me like bubbla and stuff like that, and she calls me like like a bunch of words in Yiddish when she's like 
That's a rich language heritage you got. It really is. Uh, I admire it. And Yiddish... That's what my dad said. Always. Yeah, no. But Yiddish is one of those languages. It's sort of a blend of Russian and Hebrew and a bit of German and a bit of other Eastern European influences. And it's just... it's. It's, it's an interesting study in, in how language develops on its own. You don't need classes. You just you talk. Anyway, uh, I don't know if that made any sense. So what happens is during the Dark Ages, as the cultures separate, as the East remains civilized and the West becomes more barbaric, as the East remains Greek and the West becomes uh, keeps with its Latin, but the Latin begins to change, and the origins of Italian and Spanish, Portuguese and French uh, begin to develop, the churches diverge. The churches become separate. And ultimately, the Latin church and the Greek church have what's called a schism. Actually, it's the first of many schisms. And the schism has to do with whether Jesus was around at the creation or whether Jesus himself was only around after he was born. And the I think the Western Christians believe that Jesus was there at the moment of creation, the Word of God made flesh, the Word of God that creates. And the East tend to view the specific thing that was Jesus more as coming about through the Incarnation. And there was, it's just weird theological stuff. But what really it is, is these are people now from different worlds. This is still civilized, this is now medieval. It's different. So the Christian church splits. And what gives us today's religions around here. Most of us are not Orthodox Christians. Some of us may be. Most of us are not. Most of us come from the Western Christian or Roman Catholic tradition. And then that tradition splits in the 1500s to form Protestants and Reformed Christians and all sorts of other Christian denominations. But it comes through Rome, through a medieval period. So when I talk about the Christian church from now on, I'm not really talking about the East. For the most part, I'll be talking about the church in the West. So just bear that in mind. Okay. Pope Leo the Great is the first hint that the church is going to be really a big deal. That Constantine's dream that the church will help Rome will, to an extent, in a weird way, come true. Even if it doesn't save Rome, it saves a lot that was in Rome. Remember, Leo is the pope when the uh, Huns come down uh, into Italy to destroy Rome. Leo, Pope Leo, not the Emperor Honorius uh, or Theodosius, Pope Leo comes out of the city across the Tiber to speak to Attila personally. Pope Leo gets the Huns to leave, either by paying them off or by overawing them with the majesty of God, or probably a little bit of both. So Pope Leo is called Leo the Great, and he's also called the secret Roman Emperor, because Leo is the pe person that the people look to for help and leadership. The emperor was hiding out in the swamps of Ravenna. It's Pope Leo who stayed in Rome, who spoke for Rome, who protected Rome. So the church is going to get much power, much respect. And as the various chieftains rule over these little microstates, the church still keeps long-distance communication open throughout the West. The church is the only organization that does. Everyone else thinks in terms of the locality. The church thinks in terms of the people of Christ. Now, in the East, there was a tradition among people who wanted to leave the world and live for God. They would become hermits in the desert. They'd find a rock to sit on or... They'd find a cave to live in, and they'd let their clothing rot, and they wouldn't live with any other people, and they'd eat whatever they found, berries, nuts, honey, whatever. So like John the Baptist. And they're allowed to do this, they're able to do this because the climate in this area is warm. I mean, it's desert. All they need is some source of water and some source of meager food, and they can live a fairly long life in the desert as a hermit, praying to God. They don't have a job. They don't have a wife. They don't have family. And some of them are women. They don't have husbands. Well, in the West, you can't do that. 
The farther north you get, the colder it gets in the wintertime. You need a real shelter during the winter, especially in an area where it snows. Also, the climate is so much more wet. It's just harder to live alone. So um, a guy named Benedict comes along with an alternative to living as a hermit. He becomes canonized a saint, so he is Saint Benedict. And he comes up with his famous rule, the rule of Saint Benedict, the Benedictine rule with a capital R. And what the rule is, is a set of regulations to establish the world, uh, the, the Christian church's first monasteries in the West. Now, a monastery is a place where monks live. Not, not those kind. But monks are holy men of God. They're not priests, because they're not leading congregations. They're trying to live lives away from the world. So what a monastery is, is kind of a place for people who would have been hermits in the East to live together in serving God. Female monks are called nuns. They also leave the world, they leave the world of work and of family, and they spend their life in prayer and service. Now, monks do too. It's not like monks don't, don't do labor. They do a lot of labor. In fact, monks probably work as hard or harder than any other person in those days. But monks and nuns have to live together. Being a hermit will not work in Europe the way it worked in the Near East. So Benedict comes up with a series of rules that's going to let people live a holy life in close contact with other people who are trying to live a holy life. It's the rules of monasteries and of monks. That's the St. Benedict's rule. And one of the things that Benedict controls very closely is time. Every few hours, I think it's every four to six hours, there's a prayer meeting where people sing or read from the Bible. So every four to six hours, you're getting together with the other monks to worship. Now, throughout the day, that means that the work day is divided up into sections of time between the prayer meetings, between the singing and the chanting and the, the reading of the word and so forth. But this also includes the middle of the night. So you've got prayer meetings in the middle of the night. So monks go to sleep. Then they wake up, ding, 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 with the bells. They go to services, they pray, they sing, they go back to bed. What this schedule does, as far as we understand the human brain, is it prevents something from happening the way it normally does when we sleep. Human beings need sleep. If we don't sleep, we go crazy. Our body can't handle it. We require sleep. But we not only require sleep, we require dreams. Dreams are a way for our mind to work out tension. Yeah. So you're saying that it prevents you from That's exactly what I'm saying. The kind of dream that is most active and satisfying is called rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep. And what scientists have done as they learned about it is basically what happens is as the person is dreaming, their eyes move as if they're actually awake. That's rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep. We, to remain sane, need REM sleep. If we don't get enough of it, it's like poison builds up in our con subconscious. It's like poison builds up in our system. And a person can literally go off the rails. They can literally have a schizoid break with their life and suddenly become a raving lunatic. Well, what happens with the monks is they get a little REM sleep, but they don't get it regularly, they don't get it naturally, they don't get it routinely. What it does is it renders the monks into a state of mind where everything seems a little magical. I don't know if you've ever gone without sleep for a while. It's not always horrible. It's not always pleasant. It depends on the circumstances, I guess. But if you haven't had sleep and you're going about your business, you probably don't want to operate heavy machinery. You probably don't want to drive. 
because you're sort of semi in La La Land. The monks were in a state of mind perpetually, thanks to this ongoing set of prayer meetings, that kept them open to the possibility of seeing miracles, of intuiting things. It's like they're in a half-dream state while awake because they don't get proper REM sleep. So on the one hand, the monks work very hard, they pray very hard. On the other hand, they're not in a hyper-rational state of mind. They're in a slightly altered state without drugs, just with enough interference with their sleep to cause this altered state, which gives them something important. It gives them that sense of being connected to God. It gives them even religious ecstasy, the sense that God is touching their lives, that God is working through the world. I don't know if I'm expressing this well, but I hope that you understand that when you're in a mental state like that, your dreams can seem real. And reality, you can see things that maybe nobody else will see. You can intuit things, imagine connections between things that other people wouldn't. And this isn't always a bad thing in a moment. I don't know if you've ever made a piece of art or built something with your hands or or written something down and you've worked so hard at it, but you need to leave it alone for a while so that you come back at it fresh and then you look at it fresh. Well, usually what happens is you sleep. And when you look at it fresh, you're in a different frame of mind. So you can see things that were not obvious to you when you were working on it last night. The monks have this because of this. Yes. Where, like, your sense of reality is kind of altered in a way that, like, you don't really see exactly what's happening. You see, like, some other kind of version yeah. that does make you look... That's exactly what I mean. That is precisely what I'm talking about. I can tell you, my college, <clears throat> Bates College, required a senior thesis, 50 to 75 page research project in order to graduate. And I, of course, chose a historical topic. I chose a topic in the Russian Civil War when the communists were trying to take over. I wanted to study some people who fought the communists. But I wasn't a good student, and I wasn't a good researcher. And I left it, I left it really to the last moment. See, I had made a fundamental mistake. I had chosen to do a research topic that I had personally been studying for years because I knew about it and I could just write it. The problem was, at Bates, at that time, they wanted to see all the research. They wanted to know where I got information. But I had been studying this stuff for years, and I didn't know where I got the information. I just knew it. So I had to reverse engineer my sources. I wrote the paper, which, and then I found sources to justify what I said. That's the back word way of doing it. It's a bad way of doing it. Don't ever do that. And I needed to write from Friday morning until Monday afternoon without interruption to get the final draft in on time. So starting on Friday, I worked through Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night. And I was awake writing desperately on adrenaline. And finally, the thing was due 3 p.m. Monday. I show up at 3 p.m. Monday. But it was the springtime, and it was the time change, because the time change happened different in 1985 uh, than it does today. So I showed up at 4 o'clock, not 3 o'clock, with my thing that I had just got. And I was, ah! I, I, but they accepted it. They understood what had happened. And they knew me by that point. I, again, I wasn't a great student. I, I knew my stuff, but I wasn't a scholar. Never, never really has happened. That night, my wife, who was my girlfriend, came up to get me out of there. She had graduated a few years before, and uh, so I, I was. Uh, she was coming up to celebrate the completion of this senior thesis, which was an ordeal. Uh, that night. It's about the only time I have ever struck her. 
because I was having a dream that I was on a caravan in the desert and that a thief was in my room. And so without thinking, I fought the thief off. And then I woke up and realized it was her. Thank God I didn't hurt her. Now she knew I didn't hit her. She knew it wasn't me. It was a nightmare. But it was a nightmare made worse by all that stress and all that lack of sleep. The world of sleep and dreams and the world of waking reality had blended. So try not to do that to yourself, okay? Pick a topic if you're doing a research topic that you know a little about. <clears throat> But always record where you get information from and always try to sleep. And if there's a time change near your deadline, find out about it. <laughs> and maybe the first night afterwards, make sure that you're alone. Make sure your cats and dogs or whoever do not come in and sleep with you because you might be in an altered state and you might be unusually dangerous to yourself and others. I'm, I'm not joking. I've been there. I've told you the story. Do with it what you will. Does that, but does that sound what you, like what you were talking about? Yeah. yeah. Not fun. <laughs> oh, God. Um, on the way down to her place, um, she pointed out that as we were driving by this hillside, there were a bunch of Swedish cows. And they were uh, Swedish cows because they were built, they had been bred specially to be in the mountains. So their front legs were shorter than their back legs so that they could stay on the hillside without being tilty all the time. And it took me about 45 seconds to look at her and say, Tina, you're lying, aren't you? And she said, <laughs> and I said, I couldn't tell. Yeah, I'm really not in my own normal state of mind, am I? Because I actually looked at the hill, and for a moment, I saw cows with little stumpy front legs and really big, long back legs that were sort of like this, going up the steep hill. Yeah, watch out for that. So anyway, the monks have this. They have the sleep system. But really, what they have is uh, they have three vows that they take. Benedictine rule. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. They will not acquire wealth. They will not have sex or families. And they will obey the chain of command as if Christ himself were speaking. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. And I think what I'm going to do is I'll go into more detail about them on Monday. That's where we are for today. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I see none. Thanks to those of you. That always gets me. Thanks to those of you, or at least it surprises me, who participated. Thanks to the rest of you for listening. You may talk quietly amongst yourselves, even you at home.